Okay. Good evening. How you doing? Uh, it's probably going to be afternoon for you, but uh, we're starting on Chapter 2 of The Hobbit. Uh, here's Baby Yoda. He's going to help us uh, hold the book today. All right. Good job from The Mandalorian. Thank you. So, uh... So, if you remember, uh, Bilbo uh, had just went to sleep. And he's not even sure he wants to go on this wretched adventure. So, we'll find out what happens. Maybe he'll say no and the book will be over. <laughs> Pretty short book. All right. Chapter 2. Roast Mutton. Up jumped Bilbo and putting on his dressing gown went into the dining room. There he saw nobody, but all the signs of a large and hurried breakfast. There was a fearful mess in the room and piles of unwashed crocks in the kitchen. Nearly every pot and pan he possessed seemed to have been used. The washing up was so dismally real that Bilbo was forced to believe the party of the night before had not been part of his bad dreams, as he had rather hoped. Indeed, he was really relieved after all to think that they had all gone without him. Without bothering to wake him up. That was never a thank you, he thought. And yet in a way, he could not help feeling just a trifle disappointed. The feeling surprised him. Don't be a fool, Bilbo Baggins, he said to himself. Thinking of dragons and all the outlandish nonsense at your age. So he put on an apron, lit fires, boiled water and washed up. Then he had a nice little breakfast in the kitchen before turning out the dining room. By that time, the sun was shining and the front door was open, letting in a warm spring breeze. <whistles> Bilbo began to whistle loudly and to forget about the night before. In fact, he was just sitting down to a nice little second breakfast in the dining room by the open window when in walked Gandalf. My dear fellow, said he, whenever are you going to come? What about a, an early start? And here you are having breakfast, or whatever you call it, at half past ten. They left you the message because they could not wait. Eh, what message? said poor Mr. Baggins on the fluster. Great elephants, said Gandalf. You are not at all yourself this morning. You've never dusted the mantelpiece. What's that got to do with it? I've had enough to do with washing up for fourteen. If you had dusted the mantelpiece, you would have found this just under the clock, said Gandalf, handing Bilbo a note. Written, of course, on his own note paper. This is what he read. Uh, Thorn and Company to Burglar Bilbo Greeting. For your hospitality, our sincerest thanks. And for your offer of professional assistance, our grateful acceptance. Terms, cash on delivery up to and not exceeding one fourteenth of total profits, if any. All travelling expenses guaranteed in any event. Funeral expenses to be defrayed by us or our representative if occasion arises and the matter is not otherwise arranged for. Thinking it unnecessary to disturb your esteemed repose, we have proceeded in advance to make requisite preparations and shall await your respected person at the Green Dragon Inn Bywater at 11 a.m. sharp. Trusting that you will be punctual. We have the honour to remain yours deeply, Thorin and company. That leaves you just ten minutes. You will have to run, said Gander. But, said Bilbo, no time for it, said the wizard. But, said Bilbo again, no time for that either. Off we go. To the end of his days, Bilbo could never remember how he found himself outside without a hat, a walking stick, or any money, or anything that he usually took when he went out, leaving his second breakfast half-finished and quite unwashed up, pushing his keys into Gandalf's hands, and running as fast as his furry feet could carry him down the lane 
past the great mill, across the water, and then on for a mile or more. Very puffed he was when he got to Bywater, just on the stroke of eleven. He found he had come without a pocket handkerchief. Oh, bravo, said Balin, who was standing at the inn door looking up for him. Just then all the others came round the corner of the road from the village. They were on ponies, and each pony was slung about with all kinds of baggages, packages, parcels, and paraphernalia. It was a very small pony, apparently, for Bilbo. Up the auto gat, and off we go, said Thorn. I'm awfully sorry, said Bilbo, but I've come without my hat, and I've left my pocket handkerchief behind, and I haven't got any money. I didn't get you a note until after 10.45, to be precise. Don't be precise said Dwalin. And don't worry! You'll have to manage without pocket handkerchiefs and a good many other things before you get to the journey's end. As for a hat, I've got a spare hood and a cloak in my luggage. That's how they all came to start jogging off from the inn one fine morning, just before May, on laden ponies, and Bilbo was wearing a dark green hood a little weather stayed, and a dark green cloak borrowed from Dwalin. They were too large for him, and he looked rather comic. What his father Bunga would have thought of him, I don't think. His only comfort was he couldn't be mistaken for a dwarf, as he had no beard. They had not been riding very long, when up came Gandalf, very splendid on a white horse. He had brought a lot of pocket handkerchiefs from Bilbo's pipe and tobacco. So after the party went along very after that the party went along very merrily. And they told stories or sang songs as they strode, rode forward all day, except of course when they stopped for meals. These didn't quite come quite as often as Bilbo would have liked them. But still they began to feel that adventure was not so bad after all. At first they had passed through Hobbitlands, a wide, respectable country inhabited by decent folk, and with good roads and inner two, and now and then a dwarf or a farmer rambling by on business. Then they came to lands where people spoke strangely, and sang songs Bilbo had never heard before. Now they had gone on far into the lone lands, where there were no people left, no inns, and the roads grew steadily worse. Not far ahead were dreary hills, rising higher and higher, dark with trees. On some of them were old castles with an evil look, as if they had been built by wicked people. Everything seemed gloomy, for the weather that day had taken a nasty turn. Mostly it had been as good as May can be, even in merry tales, but now it was cold and wet. In the lone lands they had been obliged to camp when they could, but at least it had been dry. To think it will soon be June, grumbled Bilbo, as he splashed along behind the others in a very muddy track. It was after tea time. It was pouring with rain and had been all day. His hood was dripping into his eyes. His cloak was full of water. The pony was tied and stumbled on stones. The others were too grumpy to talk. And I'm sure the rain has got into the dry clothes and into the food bags, thought Bilbo. All the burgling, everything to do with it. I wish I was at home in my nice hall by the fire, with the kettle just beginning to sing. It's not the last time that he wished that. Still, the dwarves jogged on, never turning round or taking any notice of the hobbit. Somewhere behind the grey clouds the sun must have gone down, for it began to get dark as they went down into a deep valley with a river at the bottom. Wind got up and willows along its banks bent and sighed. Fortunately the road went over an ancient stone bridge, for the river swollen with the rains came rushing down from the hills and the mountains in the north. It was nearly night when they had crossed over. The wind broke up the grey clouds and a wandering moon appeared above the hills between the flying ranks. Then they stopped. And Thorne muttered something about supper. And where shall we get the dry patch to sleep on? 
Not until then did they notice that Gandalf was missing. So far, he'd come all the way with them, never saying if he was in the adventure or merely keeping them company for a while. He had eaten most, talked most, and laughed most. But now he simply was not there at all. Oh, just when a visit would have been most useful too, groaned Dory and Nori, who shared the Hobbit's views about regular males, plenty and often. They decided in the end that they would have to camp where they were. They moved to a clump of trees, and though it was drier under them, the wind shook the rain off the leaves, and the drip, drip was most annoying. Also, the mischief seemed to have gotten to the fire. Dwarves can make a fire almost anywhere, out of almost anything, wind or no wind. But they could not do it that night, not even Owen and Glowen, who were especially good at it. Then one of the ponies took fright at nothing and bolted. He got into the river before they could catch him. And before they could get him out again, feeling keely, he were nearly drowned, and all the baggage that he carried was washed away off him. Of course, it was mostly food. There was mighty little left for supper and less for breakfast. There they all sat glum and wet and muttering. Well, Owen and Glowen went on trying to light the fire and quarreling about it. Bilbo was sadly reflecting that adventures are not all pony rides in May sunshine. When Balin, who was their lookout man, said, There's a light over there. There was a hill some way off with trees on it, pretty thick in parts. Out of the dark mass of the trees, they could now see a light shining. A reddish, comfortable-looking light, as it might be a fire or torches twinkling. When they had looked at it for some while, they fell to arguing. Some said, no, and some said, yes. And some, some said they could go, but go and see, and anything was better than little supper, less breakfast, and wet clothes all night. Others said, these parts are not too well known and are too near the mountains. Travelers seldom come this way now. The old maps are of no use. Things have changed for the worse and the road is unguarded. They've seldom even heard of a king around here. And the less inquisitive you are as you go along, the less trouble you are likely to find. Some said, after all, there are fourteen of us. Others said, Where has Gandalf got to? This remark was repeated by everybody. Then the rain began to pour down worse than ever. No one would go and began to fight. That settled it. After all, we've got a burglar with us, they said. So they made off, leading their ponies with all due and proper caution in the direction of the light. They came to the hill and were soon in the wood. Up the hill they went. But there was no proper path to be seen, such as might lead to a house or a farm. And do what they could, they made a deal of rustling and crackling and creaking and a good deal of grumbling and dratting as they went through the trees in the pitch dark. Suddenly, the red light shone out very bright through the tree trunks not far ahead. Now it is the Bagley's turn, they said, meaning Bilbo. You must go on and find out all about that light and what it is for. And if it all is perfectly safe and canny, said the one to the hoppers. No. Scuttle off and come back, Vic. If all is well, if not, come back if you can. If you can't, pull twice like a barn hour and once like a screech hour. We will do what we can. <laughs> off Bilbo had to go before he could explain that he could not hoot even once like any kind of owl, any more than fly like a bat. But at any rate, hobbits can move quietly in woods. 
absolutely quietly. They take a pride in it. And Bilbo had sniffed more than once at what he called all this dwarvish racket as they went along. Though I don't suppose you or I would notice anything at all on a windy night. Not the whole cavalcade had passed two feet off. As for Bilbo walking primly towards the red light, I suppose even a weasel would have stirred a whisk, whisker out of. So naturally he got up to the fire, for fire it was, without disturbing anyone. And this is what he saw. Three very large persons sitting around a very large fire of beech logs. They were toasting mutton on long spits of wood and licking the gravy off their fingers. It was a fine, toothsome smell. Also, there was a barrel of good drink at hand. And they were drinking out of jugs. But they were trolls. Obviously trolls. Even Bilbo, in spite of his sheltered life, could see that. For the great heavy faces on them, and their size, and the shape of the leg. Not to mention their language. Which was not drawing room fashion at all. Oh, all right, we'll find out what happens next. Good night.